Thank you very much for this introduction. And I apologize that I don't speak Spanish, so the talk will be in English. And also, thank you for the opportunity for presenting here and making measurements here. And I made similar measurements during the last solar eclipse in 2017. Uh, I won't show data today from the measurements of the last few days because they still have to be processed. Uh, but I intend to do something very similar. Uh, for the data I collected here. I will give sort of two talks. The first one has this title here, and if then there is still time and interest, I will talk about what I do typically on a day, and that is measuring ultraviolet radiation in Antarctica related to the ozone hole. So we'll see how it goes and whether there is time to add on this little bit. So my talk today is called Solar Eclipse Induced Changes in the Ozone Layer Observed with the Ultraviolet Visible Radiometer. And the picture here is from the last eclipse in 2017, when we had nice blue skies without any clouds, a little bit better than what we had two days ago. And the title basically has three elements. The changes introduced by a solar eclipse, the ozone layer, and the observations with the radiometer here. And on the left side of the slide is a um, graph very similar to what Chiana presented yesterday. That is the spectrum of irradiance at the Earth's surface, or that is the power from radiation per square meter at the Earth's surface. And as you can see, um, part of the spectrum is what we see with our eyes. That is the visible light, and it makes up about 42% then there is something on the left side that is the ultraviolet radiation that gives you sunburn, but you can't see it. And on the right side is infrared radiation, which you perceive as warmth. Um, and the instrument I am using on the right side has uh, 19 channels and measures irradiance between 305 nanometers, which is in the ultraviolet, and to 1,020 nanometers, which is the infrared. I made a few errors at the bottom of this plot uh, so that you can appreciate the range over which I'm measuring. And as we have seen yesterday, the plot shows in gray the spectrum outside the Earth's atmosphere. And where we are, there is less radiation because first in the ultraviolet, radiation is absorbed by the ozone layer. In the visible, there is Rayleigh scattering in the atmosphere. There's absorption by aerosols. And in for infrared, where you have these large troughs here, you have a lot of absorption by water vapor here. So what I'm interested in is, is the change in the solar spectrum during an eclipse at the Earth's surface and in turn the effect on the ozone layer, which is this stratosphere, which I will explain uh, in a few minutes. And the unique thing about the instrument that I'm using here, and that was installed on the roof here just a few days ago, is that it has a dynamic range of 10 orders of magnitude. That means it doesn't saturate when it sees the radiation during noon, but I'm still having plenty of signal when the sun is occluded by the moon. I actually can see the spectrum of, of moonlight just at night with this thing, so I can uh, very nicely see the change in the intensity of light as a function of time as the eclipse progresses. And it's called a GeoVivis 3511 radiometer, which is made by my company, Biospherical Instruments in San Diego. So let's go to what an eclipse does. And you have all seen these pictures here. So the moon goes in front of the sun. And you might think, well, how complicated can it be? Um, first, you have the spectrum of the full sunlight, and the spectrum when the moon is in front of it is the spectrum of full sunlight minus the area that is blocked by the moon. But it's not quite as simple because the sun doesn't have a solid surface, as we also heard yesterday. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk a little bit of the sun here. And when you, uh, if you had been in the talk yesterday, you would have learned uh, that in the center of the Sun is the nuclear reaction where helium gets, um, hydrogen gets converted to helium 
saturates the energy, then you have the radiative zone where it moves out, the convective zone uh, where you have this turbulent mixing, um, and at the end uh, you have the photosphere, and that's actually what we see with our eyes. But the sun is not solid, so the photosphere is about 500 uh, kilometers thick, which is teeny tiny compared to the diameter of the sun, which is 700,000 kilometers. And the radiation that you see with your eyes is from the outermost layer of the photosphere down to 500 kilometers. And that is shown on the right plot here. So when you look at the center of the sun, you, you look in this direction here. Yep, you see my black cur cursor here. Um, and the radiation you see comes out from this point to this point here. And that is obviously not drawn to scale here. It's just to, to get the principle. As I said before, this layer here is only 500 kilometers thick. So now if you look at the edge of the sun, which we also call the limb, you look equally far into the sun, but you are still in a cool area of the sun here. If you look here, you look much farther into the sun, so it's hotter. And hotter means it's brighter, but it also means that your spectrum is different. And Gianna yesterday mentioned black body radiation and um, a, a good analogon to black body radiation is an incandescent light bulb, just a standard light bulb that if you have at home, uh, not an LED light source, but a light bulb. And if you have a dimmer at home and you turn, um, I should smile. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and you, you turn your light dimmer, it doesn't only get less bright, also, the color changes, turns to the red. And that's exactly what's happening here. So as the, um, the moon occludes the sun, uh, you first hide a little bit of the outer layer of the sun, which is darker and cooler. And you can appreciate from this picture, it doesn't look uniformly uh, bright. It is darker at the edge than it is in the center. And if you move farther in, uh, you occlude more and more of the bright stuff. And as the eclipse uh, pro processes, like on this picture here, uh, you have more of the darker stuff. So now if you do a theoretical calculation, you come up with a plot like this here. So here's the, the plot on the right side. And what's plotted here is the limp darkening effect, as we call it, versus the fraction of the sun that is visible. So before the eclipse, you add one. You see the whole sun. Oops, sorry, I was too fast. Then as the moon goes in front of the sun, it first occludes um, the rim of, of the sun, which is darker. So compared to a hypothetical sun that is equally bright everywhere, your radiation goes a little bit up because you occlude something that is darker. And as the eclipse progresses, uh, it goes the opposite way because you occlude the bright center part of the sun and what's left here is the teeny tiny rim. And you can also appreciate from this plot that it depends on wavelengths. So these numbers that are plotted here are the wavelengths and ultraviolet goes from 306 in this plot here to about 380 nanometers. So ultraviolet is attenuated the most. If you almost have a totality you only get about 20% of the radiation compared to a hypothetical equally bright sun. Um, and if you look at the infrared, the black line is 1,020 nanometers, uh, you get much less of attenuation. And when you calculate ozone, which absorbs in the, at 306 nanometers, but almost doesn't absorb at 340 nanometers, you have to take this effect into account. So now let's look at how the radiation changed during the uh, eclipse on the 21st of August 2017. And as you expect, um, well, the, the, the broken line here is the start of the eclipse and the end of the eclipse. And in the center, there's the totality. The radiation goes down and then it goes up again. It's higher at the end because the eclipse occurred in the morning. And of course, the sun goes up and up and up till noon. Um, so you get this pattern here. Without an eclipse, you would have seen radiation that resembles these um, 
smooth lines here. So now if I form the ratio between uh, measurements during the eclipse versus measurements uh, without the eclipse, I would get the plot on the right side here. And as you can expect, it goes down, it goes up. But if you look closely here, uh, you see that it goes more down in the UV, which is printed in these uh, pinkish colors, than in the blue and the green. And that is because of the limb darkening effect that I have explained earlier, which you have to take into account when you want to calculate ozone from your data. And that will go up in a minute. So now let's zoom in on a different time scale here. Um, so the, uh, the line with the long and the now, where my cursor is here between here and here is totality. And the plot here only shows a, a, a period of five minutes. So about one and a half minutes before totality and one and a half minutes after totality. And as you can see, this is a logarithmic scale. The radiation changes dramatically by about two orders of magnitude just over that one and a half minutes. And you probably have experienced that yourself two days ago how quickly it got dark just before totality. Um, I also should point out that there are little drops here and that I forgot to mention, maybe I go back to my earlier slide here. Um, my radiometer has a little shadow band that goes over it and it goes every three minutes, it goes over it and includes uh, the collector of the radiometer. Um, and by doing so, it occludes the direct sun. So I measure either radiation from the direct sun plus the sky, or I only measure radiation from the sky. And from the difference, I calculate uh, the direct irradiance of the sun, uh, which is also useful. I don't want to go into details here, but uh, that shadow band explains these drops here. Um, what I also want to point out here is that the lines are still smooth during totality. So even though the radiation is so much less, the instrument doesn't have a problem in actually uh, measuring this, except at the very shortest wavelengths um, where the measurement is in the noise, as you can appreciate here. So now the plot on the right side uh, shows the reduction factor. So that's just the factor by which the radiation during totality is dimmer or less bright than if there were no uh, eclipse. And it ranges between about a factor of 10,000, so it's a 10,000 times darker during the eclipse as it would be without an eclipse in the UV. And it, it goes up um, to the visible in the infrared, and it's a little bit less here. And the reason is, if you imagine the moon is in front of the sun, all the radiation that we are seeing actually here has to enter the atmosphere outside the shadow of the moon and has to scatter uh, several times until it hits the detector at the ground. And scattering is much more stronger in the blue and the ultraviolet than it is in the visible. So you get actually less uh, reduction in the UV because more radiation uh, gets uh, from outside the th shadow th where you are standing and observing it. Uh, you also see that increase here uh, in the UV and that increase here, which is off scale, at 940 nanometers, and that's absorption in the atmosphere. In the UV, it is the absorption from ozone in the troposphere, the lowest layer of the atmosphere. At 940 uh, nanometers, it's absorption by water vapor in the atmosphere. Yes, you can imagine as radiation gets scattered in the atmosphere and gets absorbed, if there is something that absorbs the radiation, you get a much larger attenuation, so your reduction factor goes well up, and that's the case here, both in the UV and the 940 nanometers here. And I had a colleague who is a professor in Munich, and he specializes in something that's called Monte Carlo simulations. That is a sophisticated radiative transfer model. It's basically a computer simulation uh, where you can calculate what the radiation would be during totality. And one of his very bright students set it up for the eclipse that I was observing in 2017 and calculated what the radiation uh, should have been and then compared it to my measurements here. Uh, the model is very complicated and I don't want to 
go into details here, but what I want to show you is the comparison between what was modeled, these are the solid lines here, and what was measured, these are the dots in these plots, and it's for different wavelength ranges. So this is in the UV. You see it goes from 306 nanometers. You may not be able to read it here on the screen, to 395 nanometers, so that's in the ultraviolet range. And you see very good agreement. Then the next plot here is in the visible. That goes from 412 nanometer, which is blue, uh, to 555 nanometers, which is plot in red here. It's actually a green color, but the way it's plotted here, it's, it's in red. And you see almost perfect agreement between my measurements um, and the simulations. And again, these lines here uh, are the lines uh, between the start and the end of totality. And uh, there is no comparison to this gray range because that's when the shadow band went over it. So he didn't do the simulations uh, when the shadow band went over it, which actually doesn't make much of a difference because the shadow band doesn't have a sun to occlude because there is nothing. All the radiation that I'm seeing is not from the corona, it is from the radiation of the sky. So the corona contributes very, very little to all, all this stuff here. And to finish up, the plots on the left, on, on the bottom right here, is the comparison between measurements, again, the dots, and the simulations into the infrared. So now I go to the next portion of my talk here. We just talked about uh, the measurements with my radiometer. Now we talk about the ozone layer. And as you know, ozone is a molecule consisting of three atoms of oxygen, which is shown here. And it's produced in the stratosphere by the ultraviolet radiation of the sun, which is much stronger in, in the stratosphere than it is here, which splits up the ozone molecule. Then you get two ozone atoms, which combine with an ozone model, uh, with, with the oxygen molecule to get ozone here. There are also processes that destroy ozone, but I don't want to go into these details. But as a result of this chemical reaction, we have the ozone layer, which is shown here. And the, it is mostly in the stratosphere. So that's the purple line here. So all our weather here occurs in the troposphere. So that goes about up to 10, 15 kilometers, depending where you are on the planet. The troposphere is higher in the tropics, close to where we are. So let's say it goes about, about 15 kilometers. When you are in a plane, you are uh, traveling close to the um, top layer of the troposphere. Maybe you go a little bit into the stratosphere. But the ozone layer is really mostly in the, in the stratosphere. There's a little bit of ozone in the troposphere, in particular at the bottom because of air pollution. So that's the bad ozone, as we call it, that you breathe in with the smog in town. Um, and as I said, the reason why we have an ozone layer is because of the production of ozone uh, in the stratosphere as, it, as the oxygen is broken down by ultraviolet radiation. Uh, the ozone layer is also important for the temperature structure of the atmosphere because the ozone absorbs radiation of the sun. And if you absorb something, it gets hot. So at 50 kilometers, somewhere off this chart here, at the end of the stratosphere, it's actually as warm as it is at the surface. We all know when you go up in the troposphere, it gets colder and colder. When you're in a plane and, and, you, and you, the, the pilot says how cold it is outside, and we have minus 50 degrees, but then it goes up again. And the reason uh, for this is, is the ozone layer. And because of this temperature structure, the weather only occurs in the troposphere, because as we know, when you warm up a gas, it goes up, but it can't go into stratosphere because the stratosphere is already so warm. Uh, so there is no incentive for something that is warm to get in something that is more warm. There's no buoyancy basically to get higher. That's why all the clouds sort of stop at the end of the, the troposphere here. But the importance of the ozone layer is that it absorbs the ultraviolet B radiation of the sun. So that's the radiation that gives you sunburn. It completely blocks the ultraviolet C radiation. So there is no ultraviolet C radiation at the Earth's surface. And that's defined between 100 nanometers and 280 nanometers, whereas UV B radiation is defined between um, at 280 nanometers and 350 nanometers. 
And then the longest wavelengths of the UV radiation called UVA radiation gets mostly through. Um, and that makes your skin go leathery. If you are outside in the sun a lot and get older, you get wrinkles. And that's not only because of the UVB, it's also because of the UVA radiation. So that was a little introduction to the ozone layer. Now we go to the first portion of my title, the solar eclipse-induced changes. Um, whenever you disturb something and let it rebound, mm -hmm you get a wave, something swings. So if you have the moon blocking the sun, it gets colder. You probably have experienced that two days ago. If it gets colder, the air contracts. If it gets warmer again, when the eclipse is over, it gets warmer again and the air expands. So you have a force that leads to contraction and a force that leads to expansion. And the same is true when you hit the string of a guitar, you let it go and then you get a wave. You put a little pebble into water, you get ripples in the water. You see the wave going up. If you have a duck swimming, you see uh, the waves behind the duck here. You see the same in a boat. So these are called bow waves. And as you can imagine, if you look at this picture here and compare it to this picture here, if something is moving, you have these waves going outside, but then you have a front and you don't see actually any wave in front of the duck or in front of the boat. And the same is true when you have a fighter jet here in the true and you're seeing this and it goes at supersonic speed. You can't hear the, uh, the fighter jet and eventually you will hear that you have this supersonic bloom, boom. And something similar occurs when the sun, the, uh, when the shadow of the moon goes over the earth because it travels at hypersonic speed like a fighter jet would do. And it uh, sets off waves into the uh, in the atmosphere, like we hear. And uh, here's an example or measurements of when this occurred during the last solar eclipse. And uh, these are changes in electrons in the ionosphere. So now the ionosphere shown here is another layer of the atmosphere, which is much higher than the troposphere and the stratosphere. It starts at about 85 uh, kilometers and it goes up to, let's say, 1,000 kilometers. And the ionosphere is there because up there, the radiation of the sun is so strong. You have X-rays and you have a very short wave UV radiation and that splits the electrons from the atoms. So it ionizes as you have electrons uh, and, and they are affected by the Earth's magnetic field, for example, as we have also heard yesterday. But the interesting thing is uh, that the concentration of those electrons as the shadow of the moon goes over the Earth spins off these bow waves like we have seen in front of the duck in the ionosphere. So if you look closely at this picture here where my cursor is currently, that is the point of totality when this measurement was taken here. And you see these, these lines going up here, which look very similar than the lines of the supersonic aircraft that I showed earlier here, right? You see these, these structures here? And then you compare it with this, so it's very similar. So there is evidence that when the moon shades the sun, it spins off waves in the atmosphere, or at least in the ionosphere. Uh, but whether it affects the stratosphere to the same degree, it's not as well established. And that's why my research comes in. So there have been publications in the past where people measured during a, a total solar eclipse and at measure the ozone. And, and they determined that the eclipse induces waves in the ozone layer. And I'm a little bit surprised about the magnitude of those measurements, which I explain in a minute, because between day and night, you get about a 2% change in the total column ozone, which is all the ozone between the surface and the top of the atmosphere. So why should a rather short a solar eclipse generate changes in the ozone layer that are larger compared to what you see between day and night here. So now the plot on the left side is from a publication and what's plotted on top here is the change in ozone measured by that instrument. And the ozone is measured as the total column in Dobson units. So the DU stands here for Dobson units. 300 Dobson units, which is here, 
uh, is equal to a layer of ozone of three millimeter thickness, so very small. If you were to bring all the ozone to the, uh, to the surface of the Earth, at, at the at pressure at the surface of the Earth, all that ozone would be just three millimeter high. And for some reason, you measure it in Dobson units, which is just a factor of 100 larger. So again, three in a Dobson units is equal to a layer of three millimeter of ozone at the surface. And according to those measurements, the ozone went down during the eclipse from about 300 Dobson units, 240 Dobson units, so 25% change, which is impossible. And the author concluded, yes, that's an artifact of my measurements here. So they said, well, I take these artifacts out by putting some bits through it. These are the red lines. And then I compare the, the fluctuation about these lines. And that's shown in the lower plot here. And then they say, well, all these fluctuations must be uh, because of those waves in the, in the atmosphere that I spun off with the shadow of the moon going over the Earth here. And they are an order of 10 Dobson units. So 10 Dobson units relative to 300 Dobson units. So that's about um, 3%, right? And I thought that that's a little bit large. And on the right side is a similar plot uh, that was published earlier, where, where again you see changes in the ozone layer from uh, 300 to 270 uh, Dobson units which is about 10%, and they claim that it's already corrected for the limb darkening effect that I have uh, explained earlier, and they think that it's real, and I just say, well, I, I don't believe this. And that started, um, that made me make these measurements in 2017, which I show here. So these are my measurements during the total solar eclipse in 2017, and the lines that peak here are the lines before I correct for the limp darkening effect. And I may remind you of this plot that I have shown you earlier, that when the moon occludes the sun, that the attenuation is largest at the shortest wavelengths. So the shortest wavelengths, again, at UV, and then you have the blue, the green, and the red, which we see with our eyes, and the black and the infrared, which we don't see. So now ozone is calculated from the difference of attenuation at 306 nanometers and at 340 nanometers. So 306 nanometers has a larger limb darkening effect, meaning it's dark, it's it's darker because of, of the sun. Um, my algorithm that calculates ozone doesn't know whether it's because of the moon or whether it's because there's more ozone. Ba basically, when you reduce the radiation at 306 nanometers because of the eclipse, the algorithm thinks, oh, there must be more ozone in the, in, in the atmosphere because suddenly the radiation at 306 nanometers goes down faster than it does at 340 nanometers, which causes this increase here. So that's the, the artifact of the limb darkening effect. So now if I correct for it, I get these curves down here. And again, like I had shown in earlier plots here, uh, the first line here, the, the broken line is the start of the eclipse, so the first contact. This line is the second contact, totality is in the center here, this uh, little broken line, so between the start of the eclipse and totality, I may get a change of less than five Dobson units, so much smaller than we have seen in the plots before. And after the eclipse, when you think, well, you should really see the waves in the atmosphere, there's almost no change. So these measurements of mine basically show what other people have measured, that there is a significant change in the ozone layer, but really it doesn't occur. You may recall that we had another eclipse recently, and that was an annular eclipse. And the instrument that I uh, had here also made observations during this eclipse in Fort Collins in Colorado. And I want to show you a few pictures here, if it advances. Huh. It didn't change the screen for some reason. Fast. Well, 
as you see here, you have again this dip because of the eclipse and uh, what you expect without an eclipse here. And I calculated, and uh, by the way, it was not, oh, it says your internet connection is unstable. Um, it was not a total eclipse. We know it's an annual eclipse, but I wasn't even at that area where it was annual. So it didn't go down to zero like it, you would expect to a total eclipse. But anyway, I calculated ozone from this between the first contact and the last contact. And you see these little fluctuations here, and they are the order of maybe one or two uh, Dobson units. There's actually some interesting features here before uh, the first contact, and I can't explain this, so it's still a little bit of a mystery, but when the eclipse was occurring, there's almost no fluctuation. Again, that's uncorrected and corrected for the limb darkening, but maybe there's a one or two adoption unit change, but, but very small. Uh, so in con contradiction to what has been published earlier, I do not see any changes in ozone, and I'm here to determine during this eclipse whether the same is also true here, which I presume but the data hasn't been um, processed here. So I want to conclude the first uh, part of my talk here. And you can read through this, but I, I just read it to you, is that the, chi the change in light level at the Earth's surface during a solar eclipse is affected by the solar limb darkening. I hope I explained this sufficiently what it means. Then ultraviolet radiation is more affected than visible radiation and infrared radiation by this limb darkening effect. And that also leads to spurious changes in ozone uh, because of this. So the shadow of the moon travels at supersonic speeds over the Earth's atmosphere, resulting in bow waves in the ionosphere, which has been shown with measurements. However, the effect on the ozone layer is less well established and published results are conflicting. So my measurements during the 2017 total solar eclipse and also during the recent annual uh, solar eclipse don't show clear evidence that there's actually a change in the ozone layer. And I hope that my measurements in Mazatlan two days ago will get closure on the questions whether or not a solar eclipse affects the total ozone. So this would conclude the first portion of my talk, but if, if you're interested, I can continue and tell you a little bit what I'm usually doing. So, shall I continue or shall, shall we stop here? It's up to you. Okay, then I continue. So, just have a little bit of water. So, I assume you all know about the ozone hole. And it was discovered in 1985 with this famous plot here, which shows a decrease of ozone. Again, these are Dobson units from about 320 Dobson units to 200 Dobson units. But that's a huge change compared to what we have seen earlier, what happens during an eclipse. And these measurements were done at Halley's research stations in Antarctica, which is at this location here. And nobody had expected this. People had expected that the chlorofluorocarbons that we release change the ozone layer, but if that it can change it by this amount, nobody had expected it. Um, we know that when ozone goes down, UV radiation goes up, and that's, of course, the, the reason why we are concerned about changes in ozone. But at this time, there were measurements of ultraviolet radiation in Antarctica. So my company, Biospherical Instruments, I uh, got a grant from the National Science Foundation to develop and install instruments in Antarctica. And this eventually became known as the Ultraviolet Radiation Monitoring Network um, of the United States. And it expanded to seven stations at the tip of South America at Palmer Station. Here's the picture of the instrument at Palmer Station at the South Pole and at McMurdo. We are headquartered in San Diego, so we also had an instrument there. And eventually, there was also interest in uh, looking at ozone in the Arctic. So we had an instrument at Barrow, which is the northernmost point of Alaska and in the middle of Greenland. And here, for example, is the instrument in the middle of Greenland. So I've been to all these places, and it's really uh, quite an honor to, to go to places like this, and, and also quite fun. 
So the people got concerned about this, mm -hmm. and that resulted in the Montreal Protocol, or as it is more correctly known, the Montreal Protocol of substances that deplete the ozone layer, such as CFCs or chlorofluorocarbons. And the Montreal Protocol is an international treaty to phase out those substances and to protect the ozone layer of the Earth, and by doing so, guards life on Earth from harmful ultraviolet radiation. Um, it also mitigates climate change, and I have one slide on this later here. And it is more or less the only international treaty that was ratified by each country on this planet. So 200 countries on this planet about have signed off to this Montreal mm -hmm. Protocol. Um, and as part of this protocol, it is also established uh, three advisory bodies called the Technical Effects Assessment Panel, TEEP, the Scientific Assessment Panel, and the Environmental Effects Assessment Panel, or EAP. And I am a member of this panel. So we have to tell the politicians mm -hmm. uh, on an annual basis what's going on with the ozone layers, what the effects are, um, of the changes in the ozone layer, and then the Montreal Protocol gets amended. And that is also very unique to this treaty, that it can be amended or adjusted without having to go through ratification by all the countries again, because it would be impossible if, you, if every country has to convene again at the UN and, and, and make a new treaty. I mean, we know how difficult it was to... Um, to establish uh, the Paris Climate Agreement. Imagine everybody comes together. And it worked very well. So the, the plot on the right side actually uh, is the quintessential plot of what the Montreal Protocol does. And it shows the um, changes in equivalent effective stratospheric chlorine. So that's basically the chlorine from chlorofluorocarbons that is in the stratosphere and the uh, change of that over time. So without the protocol, it would have gone up and up and up and up. So this plot goes from 1950 to 2100. The Montreal Protocol, which was ratified in 1987, actually didn't do much. So the curve would have gone up like this. However, because the Montreal Protocol can be amended in adjustment, subsequent adjustments brought or uh, phased out more and more substances that deplete the ozone layer. And that is shown here. So after the, the latest adjustment in, uh, in Montreal again in 2007, now the chlorine molecules, well, the, the, the substance that contain chlorine, I should say, in the stratosphere is decreasing. And more or less everything has been phased out. So even if there were zero emissions, it's not much different from the latest scenario here. So that's really um, the most successful environmental treaty that has been ratified so far because it really works. So now, how has it affected the ozone layer? Um, this plot is from a very nice document called 20 Questions and Answers about the ozone layer, which has been compiled by one of those advisory panels, in this case, the Scientific Advisory Panel, or SAP, and it shows the change in ozone in globally um, at north and mid-latitudes, in the tropics, and in south and mid-latitudes. And the time when ozone really declined was between the late 1970s and about 1996. So you see the steep decline here. You see the steep decline here in the, uh, at southern mid-latitudes. And then the Montreal Protocol uh, kicked in and there wasn't actually much change thereafter. Now, the ozone is about 4% lower than it was before um, these chemicals destroyed ozone uh, and in, in the Northern Hemisphere and a little bit more in the Southern Hemisphere. Eventually, it will recover, but it takes a long time because it's much faster getting these substances in the atmosphere than removing them. Um, but there, that, that's basically all we can do. So we ha just have to wait another 40, 50 years, and then this problem will have gone away. And um, it's not bad. I mean, it's only a, a change of 4 to 5%. So, uh, you know, we have rectified this.
But this plot only refers to middle latitudes and the tropics. There were huge changes in ultraviolet radiation uh, at the poles. That's where the ozone hole is. And uh, this is a plot that, oops, now it comes up that, that I produced uh, a while ago, uh, trying to estimate how much UV radiation has changed over the last 50 years. Well, there were no measurements of UV radiation 50 years ago. So I had to infer this from ozone measurements here. And what the red and the yellow curve shows is the maximum UV index. You may recall the UV index is a measure of sunburn UV radiation, how much this has changed at Palmer Station where we have the measurements in Antarctica. So before the ozone hole, that was between 1970 and 1976, we calculate that UV radiation was about at this level here. Then the maximum UV radiation we have seen since goes up to here. So there is a, a factor of two and a half in between. But that's only in Antarctica. The same analysis for San Diego, where we are headquartered, shows basically no change. There are actually two curves here, and you can't actually see the difference between, because the change there is only about 3%. And at Point Barrow, you see a little bit of more change, but that is also relatively small because the ozone hole is in Antarctica and not in the Arctic. And I can't explain why that is, but um, I, I think I don't have the time here. Um, but that picture just shows you that the largest UV radiation in Antarctica at much higher latitude than in San Diego actually was higher at a few days historically than it has ever been in San Diego because of the ozone depletion there. Now, over the next, last 25 years, we actually have measurements so we can determine the change in the UV index between, in this case, 1996 and 2020. And these are the black dots here. And as you can see, it hasn't changed much. So that goes from the South Pole uh, to Barrow, Alaska, and a few in, in between. Um, so there wasn't much change. The blue curve here is if the Montreal Protocol hadn't happened, how would have UV changed? And you see there would have been a, an increase by a factor of 100 uh, over this period uh, at the poles. And at middle latitudes, we would have seen maybe 15, 20%. And it would have gotten worse and worse and worse during the 21st century. Uh, so without the Montreal Protocol, at the end of the century, we would have an UV index of maybe 30 or 35 here. So you, you would experience sunburn maybe in a third of the time than you currently do. Uh, the interesting thing of the Montreal Protocol is that it also has an effect of climate because the chlorofluorocarbons that destroy ozone have also a large uh, greenhouse gas potential, meaning their greenhouse gases such like CO2 or methane, so they contribute, uh, they contribute to the greenhouse effect here. And here's a picture from a, a publication that calculated how much the Montreal Protocol, by phasing out these substances, has already affected the climate. And um, this plot shows that over much areas over, over the continents, uh, we have already avoided about half a degree or one degree of warming, and even larger in the Arctic. So now, you know, the Paris Climate Agreement has a goal of it should go larger than 1.5 degrees, maybe a maximum of 2 degrees warming. And, and that is actually in the same ballpark. And the reason is that Paris Climate Agreement talks globally, and the effect on the tropics and the ocean is larger than, as this plot shows, in, in the Arctic in particular. Um, so the Montreal Protocol had a, a large effect on avoiding uh, warming in the Arctic. And without the Montreal Protocol, it would have gotten even worse, not only with respect to ozone, but also with respect to warming here. Well, and that more or less concludes my talk. Sorry, it was a little bit long. And I want to thank you for your attention and listening, uh, but also the National Science Foundation of the United States who funded me to come here and to make these measurements. But uh, I particularly want to thank Felipe for mm -hmm. the opportunity to be here and make these measurements and set up on the roof and all the support I, I received. And um, also from uh, Lorena Vidal, uh, who assisted me and the problems I ran into it, and Beatrice, 
who arranged this talk here. Uh, I also want to thank Graciela Alvarez and Rosa Vasquez from the US Embassy in Mexico City because as a US scientist, you actually have to get permission to do research here and you have to apply to the US Embassy uh, in, in, in Mexico City and then they reach out to the Secretaria de Relaciones Exteriores and uh, the permission to do this here just came in a week before I had to leave. So I was very nervous, but it all worked out. And the pictures at the bottom uh, were taken here. Again, this is the instrument I had here set up on the top next to the elevator here. And it's the same instruments that I had in Oregon. You may have seen it when you look down from the direction of the lighthouse. And here it was on the roof. And on the right side, you see my wife and uh, a friend who, who came. So these are citizen scientists. And uh, they used a little handheld instrument to measure ozone here, uh, which I haven't talked about. So that's also one goal of, of my project here, that I compare measurements with these handheld instruments, with measurements of my big instruments, because if both show fluctuations, I believe them. If one shows fluctuations, the other doesn't, I, I don't believe it. And, well, this concludes my talk. Thank you very much.